the Netherlands. This small European country has earned a well-deserved reputation for its exceptional street design, and particularly the bicycle infrastructure. There are bike lanes on all major car routes, a whole parallel network of bicycle paths, and great parking facilities. All this excellent cycling infrastructure is not just limited to cities, it extends seamlessly to the countryside. That's why more than a quarter of all trips are made by bicycle, making it the number one cycling nation in the world. Anybody visiting the Netherlands for the first time will be blown away by the number of bikes everywhere. You will also notice that the towns and cities are not packed with cars. Thus a common misconception is that not that many people drive here and everybody either cycles or takes public transport. Of course, a lot of people do, but the Netherlands actually has one of the highest car ownership rates in Europe, beating countries like France, Sweden, and the UK. Moreover, when you calculate the number of cars per square kilometer of land, the Dutch beat all neighboring countries in the EU with 229 cars per square kilometer. However, when you walk around any residential neighborhood, there is barely any traffic, there are car-free areas, and of course no traffic in the city centers. So how do they do it? Public space in urban and rural areas can be divided into traffic and residential areas. Traffic areas ensure the flow of traffic and residential areas restrict motor vehicle access and speed. To make getting around as easy and as safe as possible, you need to create a recognizable road network. To achieve this, there needs to be a clear hierarchy of roads, each with its own distinct design elements, which leads to a continuous road scape throughout the country and shrink predictable traffic situations, making driving more comfortable and safer. Each road category will have different road types and designs. However, as the amount of road types increases, the harder will it be for drivers to recognize the road category they are on and adjust their driving behavior accordingly. Covering all road designs in one video would take way too long, so I'll cover the basics of the three main road categories, which are through roads, distributor roads, and access roads. Large urban areas are connected by through roads. Through roads or highways ensure continuous flow of traffic over long distances. Lanes are wide, there are no obstacles, allowing driving at high speeds comfortably. Most importantly, there are no intersections at grade and only interchanges allow traffic to get on or off the highway. Bicycle paths on interchanges are separated for increased safety, and here it's designed so that bicycles don't intersect with on and off coming highway traffic. With thin urban areas, a through road encircling a city functioning as a ring road is intended to relieve congestion within the city center. However, a ring road is not always a through road in its categorization, as here for example there is a signalized intersection making it a distributor road. Bicycles or scooters are not allowed on highways, however there is always a nearby alternative such as a bicycle path or a distributor road. Smaller urban areas are connected by distributor roads, with the most significant having separated bicycle infrastructure, as it is unsafe at such high traffic volumes and speeds for cars and bikes to mix. Lining the roadway with trees introduces a visual barrier that can reduce the comfort of driving at high speeds. Also, lane markings consist of two continuous broken lines, as they are more noticeable and discourage overtaking more than a single broken line. Both the roadway and bicycle paths have rumble strips to alert drivers and cyclists in case of veering off the road. At intersections, there are traffic islands that restrict overtaking and make the crossing for pedestrians and cyclists safer and less stressful as they only have to cross one lane at a time. Shark teeth that are pointing towards you indicate that you have to yield. Notice how this intersection is built at a rather sharp angle, so the drivers have to pay a bit more attention. Bicycle paths are set back so the drivers can first yield to bicycles and then yield to motor traffic, making the maneuver easier and safer. At intersections where two distributor roads meet, roundabouts are preferred. Nevertheless, roundabouts can also be used where distributor roads intersect with access roads. When entering an urban area, it is important that there is a change in road design. There is a traffic island slowing drivers down and indicating the beginning of a built-up area. This is a very simple example where instead of two continuous lines, there is red paint to remind drivers of the lowered speed limit. Here the roadway is at the same level as the pavement, giving the feeling of a street rather than a road. And because the Hall of the Netherlands is so densely populated, there is second infrastructure outside of cities as well. This effectively eliminates the need for a car even for those living in the countryside. The distributor road shown earlier that connects nearby towns and villages to the city of Groningen was considered too indirect of a route, 
so they built a bicycle highway running parallel to the train tracks, which only saves two minutes at best. However, this kind of dedication to creating attractive alternatives to driving is necessary to reduce the amount of car trips. This video was shot on a workday afternoon, and there are all sorts of people using it, including people getting around on regular bikes, e-bikes, people cycling for sports, and people on mobility scooters. And of course, frequent bus service is also available, connecting rural and urban areas together. The rest of the roads outside built-up areas are called access roads. The first type has separated cycling infrastructure and is used in areas with relatively high traffic volumes, while the other type mixes cars and bikes together. A key characteristic of access roads is the lack of lane markings in the center of the roadway. Notice how as soon as you exit an urban area, these markings are shifted to the side to reduce the comfort of high-speed driving. For roads with medium traffic volumes, cars and bikes share the road, and these markings indicate possible bicycle traffic. On the remaining roads, which are narrow countryside routes leading to farms or villages, traffic volumes are very low. Gravel or grass tiles are placed on the sides of these roads to enable two cars to pass each other comfortably. At intersections, such as this one in a small village, you have to yield to anybody coming from the right or follow up priority signs of present. Similar to distributor roads, when entering an urban area, there is an arrowing with a speed bump indicating the beginning of a built-up area and a change of speed limit. Traffic areas in urban areas are mostly made up of distributor roads. It's important to mention that this is absolutely a street rather than a road, which would then look something like this. However, for simplicity purposes, it's still referred to as a road. These connect residential areas together, and the majority have curbside protected bicycle lanes on either side of the roadway. Bidirectional bike lanes are also used, but on roads with low traffic volumes, there are only markings indicating possible traffic, like this one in a suburban neighborhood. Preferably, there is a median in the middle of the road that discourages overtaking and acts as a buffer zone, reducing the possibility of a head-on crash. Furthermore, it acts as a mini crossing island, like those at a pedestrian crossing, but here pedestrians have the right of way. When there is parking, it's placed nearest to the roadway, thereby creating a buffer zone between moving traffic and bicycles. And on newer roads, it's built at the same level as the pavement, thus visually narrowing the roadway. Ideally though, if there are high traffic volumes and there is space, a parallel access road is constructed. The distributor road on the left ensures the flow of motor traffic, and the access road on the right provides parking and can be used by cyclists. At signalized intersections with other distributor roads, there are typically protected left and right turns for minimizing conflicts with other road users. A green arrow indicates full priority when turning, and a green light means you might have to yield to pedestrians and cyclists when turning left or right. And pretty much all traffic lights adapt their timing based on real-time traffic conditions through detection strips, which are present on both the roadway and bicycle lanes. Since all intersections should work smoothly without the traffic lights working, there is always priority signage as well as shark's teeth indicating the right of way. Here in Hurningen, bicycles get a simultaneous green light and negotiate the right of way through eye contact. It's really fascinating watching intersections during rush hour and how it just works. However, one problem with traffic lights is the constant speeding up and braking. This is where the concept of drive slow and go faster steps in. It doesn't require traffic lights and argues that traffic operates more efficiently when it travels at uniform low speeds, roughly around 40 km an hour. There is one travel lane in each direction, which is separated by a median and there is space for greenery and proper cycling infrastructure, which enhances the overall quality of the urban environment. A common myth is that the number of lanes determines the capacity of a road. It's actually determined by the intersection, which is why one travel lane turns into three here, connecting to the larger distributor road. On large roads like this, where traffic volumes are very high, the preferred design includes a dedicated transitway in the center of the road which can also be used by emergency vehicles. The necessity for a bus lane on both sides of a road or throughout its entire length can vary based on the specific route and prevailing traffic volumes. This road has a bus lane on either side of the road. However, a kilometer away, the street profile changes. There are one-way access roads parallel to the distributor road, which doesn't have two bus lanes anymore. 
At the intersection, there is a bus stop, which also acts as a short bus lane, and the detection strips enable the bus to get a head start before the rest of the traffic gets a green light. Fully separate transitways are also built where motor traffic is not allowed. This even includes transit-only bridges in a city with a population of 200,000 people. Finally, we will look at access roads in urban areas which are typically linked to a distributor road through an unsignalized intersection. Roundabouts are also used with both distributor and access roads, but I will cover them in detail in a future video. At unsignalized intersections, there are traffic islands for improving safety and intersections can be slightly raised to make drivers slow down and pay attention. The road is relatively narrow and doesn't have lane markings in the middle to make drivers go at the speed limit. There is a bi-directional bicycle path on the right side, however pedestrians don't get a priority crossing. When traffic needs to cross a bike lane, it's preferably set back. This arrangement maximizes visibility for the driver and provides a waiting space, ensuring separate yielding for bicycles and motor traffic. The best practice though is to use a continuous pavement or exit construction as it's called in Dutch. There are two types of exit constructions. The first is constructed based on the destination criterion, providing access to private properties with a subtle design. The second is built according to the construction criterion using beveled curbs and serves as a gateway to a residential area. In both cases, the pavement and the bike lane remain uninterrupted, indicating that pedestrians and cyclists have the right of way. The beveled curbs function as speed bumps, signaling to drivers that they are entering a residential area with a different road category. Access roads are a part of a 30 km per hour zone where the local resident is put first and motor traffic is of secondary importance. Look how the speed limit and parking restrictions are nearly integrated into one sign. Parking is only permitted in designated spaces which eliminates the need for signage everywhere. Here parking needs to be paid for and is done with a single sign indicating a paid parking zone and another sign with detailed restrictions. In general, traffic signs are quite small and designed to avoid visual pollution on the streets. Certain signage, such as directions to the nearest parking meter, are integrated into the pavement and cars equipped with 360-degree cameras automatically detect whether a parked car has paid for parking or possesses a valid permit. If a bicycle has been left unattended for an extended period of time, it first gets a warning and later gets taken away to prevent overcluttering of abandoned bikes. What I found really interesting is when there is nowhere else to park, it is entirely acceptable for drivers to block the way for other cars when loading or unloading People here do not mind waiting a minute or two instead of aggressively yelling, honking, or driving on the pavement. Access roads are preferably made of brick to remind drivers that they are in a residential area and to keep vehicle speeds low. Additionally, a variety of traffic calming measures are implemented such as chicanes and speed bumps which are mostly made in a way that you can go over them smoothly when going to speed limit. The same is done at intersections, which prevents unnecessary speeding up and abrupt braking throughout a neighborhood. And at intersections, the person coming from the right gets priority. This arrangement is probably the most simple, yet the most effective way of making everybody pay attention and keep vehicle speeds low. If priority is necessary, an exit construction can still be used. This is most often implemented on small main streets in residential areas that provide access to other streets. Most of which are intentionally designed one way for cars to prevent drivers from using them as shortcuts and instead make use of distributor roads. This makes a peaceful living environment for the residents as it reduces the flow of traffic through residential neighborhoods. Another way of restricting traffic is the concept of filtered permeability Cyclists and mopeds are allowed to pass through, however, motor traffic has to take a different route. Here the sign indicates that it's a dead end for cars, but cyclists can continue their journey. The area alongside the pond is exclusively accessible to pedestrians and cyclists, while cars can reach the buildings from the opposite side. By establishing separate routes for motorists and cyclists, it acts as a strong incentive for people to cycle. Some streets can be transformed into bicycle streets where cars must yield to bikes. However, cyclists are permitted to ride side-by-side side everywhere, and cars must yield to them regardless. Upon strolling through various neighborhoods, one can't help but notice the abundance of greenery. Certain streets were initially designed with exceptional street profiles that incorporate green spaces. 
For other streets, residents have the opportunity to apply for a facade garden, which is a narrow strip of land in front of their houses. If there are no costs associated with this, municipal workers will remove tiles from the pavement and fill them with soil, provided that the owner agrees to maintain the garden. Residents are also permitted to grow climbing plants, and furthermore, you can apply to take care of a flower bed around a tree and receive planting advice. And since the streets are already quite appealing, people are even more motivated to decorate them with their own flower pots and decorations. This collective effort contributes to the development of better neighborhoods for themselves and their fellow residents, fostering a stronger sense of community. So arguably, the most pleasant living environments can be found in home zones or woonerfs. The pavement and the roadway are at the same level, and it's clear that you shouldn't drive fast here. This is why speed bumps are typically considered a last resort for traffic calming, as the road design itself should convey the need for slower speeds. Here the parking is put perpendicular to the road and changes directions, creating a chicane effect and keeping vehicle speeds low. Home zones are truly remarkable places to live in. These areas typically have a lot of greenery and offer spaces for relaxation. And if you want, you can even play table tennis. Studies have shown that Dutch children are the happiest in the world. People here understand that playing outside for children must start right outside their front door. This way, they can slowly build up knowledge of their surroundings, start traveling on their own, and start becoming independent. Also, you will find permanent car-free areas creating beautiful living environments. However, all types of buildings at some point may require access for emergency or delivery purposes. This is why a car light approach is often preferred over completely car-free areas, striking a balance between accessibility and creating appealing spaces. This is the case for city centers, which are still accessible by car, however, there is not that much on-street parking and squares and plazas are usually pedestrianized. The majority of parked cars you'll encounter are delivery vehicles, and they must adhere to specific time frames for making their deliveries. This scheduling helps reduce the clutter of parked delivery vehicles throughout the entire day. This is one of the central squares in the city, serving as a market on some days. It used to be a parking lot, and this image has been floating around the internet, praising the removal of parking. Unfortunately, this is a terrible example, as right around the corner, several buildings had to be knocked down to make room for a parking garage. A better example is of course underground parking garages, where the majority of on-street parking gets relocated. The same for bicycles, there can be quite a bit of them, and there are restrictions for bicycle parking in some areas, which encourages the use of bicycle parking garages. To keep through traffic out of the inner city, Kroningen in the late 70s implemented a traffic circulation plan, dividing the city center into four sectors and establishing one-way streets. Despite facing strong criticism initially from shopkeepers, these changes ultimately led to a more vibrant inner city, and of course, attracted plenty of visitors. It is important to note that no street is ever complete. The Dutch constantly monitor traffic flows and look for possible improvements. The Netherlands serves as a brilliant example of effective road and street design, showcasing a strong commitment to safety, sustainability, and the well-being of its citizens. They have achieved an impressive balance between motorized and non-motorized transportation. This raises the question, how long will it take for the rest of the world to follow? Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please be sure to leave a like and don't forget to subscribe for more videos about creating better urban environments.